Thank you very much. I thank you, Andrew and Lisa and Ollie and everyone at PopTech for an amazing few days here in Camden. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about my two, two of my great passions in genetics and infectious disease and how they come together. So I'm going to start with a few words like outbreak, contagion, pandemic. These are words that frighten us, that conjure up images that are dramatic and exotic of monkeys deep in the forest, of armies of people in hazmat suits, of reports going around the world. And we are anxious about the coming of a dangerous virus, a global pandemic. And we imagine it'll come with a great deal of commotion and spectacle. But what if this is the image of the global pandemic, the deadly virus that we're waiting for? What if it is here um, in a quiet village with a drowsy baby and an unheard death? And this isn't the kind of image I was thinking about just a few years ago. In fact, as a computational geneticist, um, most of my time as a graduate student postdoc with Eric Lander, I was looking at images just like this, of the vast tracts of letters of DNA that make up our genomes. And, it's, and what I do is I look for patterns, patterns of natural selection. When a mutation emerges, a mutation like resistance to a deadly virus, and spreads through the population, it'll leave behind a footprint in our genomes. And we can detect those footprints by looking at individuals, random individuals, living today. It's an archaeological record we can mine. And uh, with my lab, we've developed methods, and we've applied them to genomes of individuals from all around the world. Um, and we can pinpoint in on where these mutations are occurring and what parts of the genomes. And that can give us clues to what are the things that are important for human survival. And interestingly, when we looked in there, we found a number of genes under selection in Nigeria that were critical for a virus called Lassa virus. Now, let me just ask you uh, if you can raise your hand if you've ever heard of Lassa virus. Sounds actually not bad. Um, how many of you have heard of Ebola virus? Right. Um, that's what I thought. So, Lassa virus is a lot like Ebola virus, and I'm going to try to propose to you today that it is one of the viruses you should know about, because it's one of the most devastating diseases of humanity and one of the greatest threats to our survival. Like Ebola, it's a hemorrhagic disease, which means that it causes bloody, bloody fever um, that can lead to death, and the fatality rates can be dramatic. They can be above 50% in hospital settings and in outbreaks. Um, and those, uh, so like Ebola, like smallpox, like bubonic plague, it is a deadly threat. But it is also a current public health crisis. There are thousands and even potentially tens of thousands of people that are dying every year to Lassa fever. And what's interesting about it is it's even more widespread than that. Throughout West Africa, many people are being exposed. And in fact, many of them, as you can see, have evidence of having been exposed, but have never, said, never felt that they've been sick. And so we believe that they have genetic resistance. And we believe that's because of this arms race that's been occurring for many, many millennia. And that's the kind of thing that I want to pursue. And I'm going to be studying the sequence of the individuals as well as the virus to understand this pattern. And the amazing thing about that is that you can't do that just in the United States in a lab, in a computational setting. You have to go out to the field. And one of the most rewarding things that I've done in my career is work with Christian Happy, my longtime collaborator, going to the Arua Specialist Teaching Hospital in Arua, Nigeria. And I'd argue that it's one of the most amazing places on earth. Um, it, has, it is a place where Lhasa is endemic, and the death toll is extreme. And every year, hospital staff Doctors and nurses have been dying of this virus, but yet they've stayed committed, they've stayed passionate, um, and united against Lassa fever. And in 2008, with the BNI Institute in Germany and ISTH, we formed a collaboration and we brought diagnostics. And those diagnostics are also genetic. We have genetic markers of the virus infection, and we've been able to build a diagnosis in time for care, to affect care. And in that time, they have not lost a single hospital staff, which is of great pride to the hospital. And it's the kind of work we're doing. And now we're partnering with Tulane University in Sierra Leone, also working to develop research capacity to understand these deadly viruses before they have to make that commotion that is the type that we see in the newspapers. And one of the other great things that's important to note is that this takes you know, it takes a village, it takes a team, and it takes uh, teams across the uh, Atlantic Ocean going back and forth. You can't fight a devastating disease like Lassa fever unless you have complete trust with the people that you work with and complete commitment. And I get to work with the greatest team on Earth, I think. 
and we have incredible supporters in the institutions and the funding bodies. And I just want to leave you understanding the power that genetics can have, the ability to begin to look at these diseases, uh, where they stand, to help the people in that population and to stop a global threat. Um, so thank you very much. We do this for LASA patients. Thank you.